my job in the world is generally kind of synthesis, really seeing what's happening in the world, bringing mega trends together, seeing what companies are starting to do and saying, okay, here's where we're headed. It's not to me futurism. It's really like presentism. It's like looking at what's already happening and saying, this is the stuff that's obviously, you know, already accelerating um, and where we need to go. Andrew Winston is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Andrew is a globally recognized expert on megatrends and how to build companies that thrive by serving the world. Named to the Thinkers 50 Radar class of 2020 as a thinker to watch, his views on strategy have been sought after by the world's leading companies, including 3M, DuPont, j and j Kimberly Clark, Marriott, PepsiCo, and Unilever. Andrew is the author of the bestsellers Green to Gold and The Big Pivot. Andrew's latest book, Net Positive, which we're here to talk about today. I've got a copy right here holding up. The only thing that's missing is Paul's and Andrew's signature in it. Uh, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. Um, It it was co-authored with Paul Pullman, who used to be the CEO of Unilever. It is a finalist for the Financial Times and McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award. Net Net Positive has been called an electrifying strategy for business success. And unlike any other book you've read by Merrick Chairman Ken Fraser, a wonderful rallying call by Sir Richard Branson, and Pure Heresy by Ariana Huffington. Andrew is also a respected and dynamic speaker, reaching audiences of thousands at executive meetings around the planet. He received degrees in economics, business, and environmental management from Princeton, Columbia, and Yale. And if I'm not wrong, you even served as director at Yale. Is is that right? Uh, There was a kind of research project for my first book, that was, I guess I was called a director. I don't know. That was probably a highfalutin word for, you know, researching the first book, Green to Gold, with my co-author, uh, Professor Dan Esty, who was, um, you know, still at, still at Yale. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so good to have you. Welcome to the show. Thanks. To, thanks. I'm really glad to be here again. It's good. Yeah, we, we, we did uh, your other books. We kind of did them both at the same time. We did uh, Big Pivot and, and uh, uh, Green to Gold or Gold to Green and Green to, uh, green to Gold yeah. and um, I spoke to you then. And, and we just had a great, it was a great resonance and, and it, was a, it was a nice talk. Our path has crossed over the years many times. And, I, and we actually talked, you actually had a pre-copy on your shelf last time when we talked about it. So I knew it was coming. We tickled it a little bit. Uh, now it's here. So yeah. uh, I, I just, uh, well, not just, but a few weeks ago, I was in Glasgow at COP26. I saw Paul, I saw his wife. Um, matter of fact, it was at the IKEA um, foundation type of uh, cocktail thing at the at the New York Times Climate Hub. And uh, he was all over and, and, and talking about it as well, doing amazing things. So I am interested to hear for, directly from the source. Uh, um, how have you weathered this crazy time? Is Are you saying, man, I'm so glad this is out. Uh, um, how have you been? And give us an update since the last time we met. What's going on? Well, it, it's been great. I mean, look, the the times we're in are pretty weird. Um, you know, as we're recording this, we're kind of locking down again and things are getting canceled and schools are kind of pulling back. Colleges are pulling back. I mean, we're, we're still in this pandemic. Um, I think some say this next month or two could be the worst we've had. So it, it seems like we're trying to get used to this as a way of life now, but that's hard. You know, when we started writing the book a couple of years ago, we, before the pandemic started, we wanted to get it out as fast as possible. And then the work took longer than we thought it took, I mean, the time we needed to really kind of dig in and and really lay out what it means to be a business that's really serving the world and creating more good. Um, And we thought, oh, it's going to be out late. And then by the time the pandemic was rolling along and we knew we were going to come out probably fall of this year, it it kind of worked out well from the book. I think we're coming out in a time in the last couple of months where 
companies are as focused on their role in society as they've ever been. And there's a lot of talk about becoming a regenerative enterprise or now a net positive enterprise. You know, all these words are kind of swirling around. Um, and the book's done really well. I think we're probably, we probably sold about 50,000 copies, which for a business book is a lot in a, in a couple months. Um, and I'll probably will almost definitely surpass my, my previous books, which sold well. Um, but we had a bunch of distribution problems, like so many other supply chains. We, we were out there in, in mid-October doing media. Paul was on, you know, the TV every day. I was doing podcasts and TV and radio. And, and then the books didn't get there. They didn't get to stores. They didn't, you know, people were pre-ordering on Amazon and never got it. There were just all sorts of weird distribution problems. So we're kind of relaunching. Um, I mean, that's maybe an overblown phrase for it, but we're going to kind of come out again in a few weeks and say, okay, it's more available now. Um, Cause it's really painful to have any product you, you make and not people want to buy it. And then they can't actually get their hands on it or they don't run into it. They don't see it. So it's been really word of mouth and done, you know, very well, but I think we can, we can do much more. You, you definitely can do much more and you, but you have done very well uh, considering all the hassles. I just want to break down a couple of things that you just, that you just mentioned. And, and I want to kind of go deeper into, into what that means. And I've noticed that because I do a lot of podcasts with book authors. So, um, and, and most of them are all, I, I live in Hamburg, Germany. Most of them are from the UK books or, or from America uh, and a few from Australia. Um, all of them, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the Brexit and the, the, the new EU regulations that went into effect in January, Europe has a, a strict tax now to distribute or bring books or, or any kind of goods from other countries into the EU that aren't there that have to have extra taxes. None of these systems were updated especially during the pandemic to say, hey, the EU just switched this law. Now we've got to charge this tax. And so what happens is people are still ordering. They're still processing. The books never arrive because the system doesn't say, hey, we've got to charge this customer at the end. Now in the delivery process, an extra fee for whatever they've purchased of a product. And not only is that not happening, the systems aren't in place. But the notification, hey, your book's here at the post office or at the customs area, you need to come by, pay this tax or this fee to, to bring this outside product into the, into the European Union to, in order to get it. So we're just in a pandemic. We're in this crazy time already. And but, but it's not a natural catastrophe. It's not, you know, and the systems are already failing us. And so I want to kind of just first, say i mean that ties to what you write about yeah. right what yeah. where we need to go and and what your thoughts and feelings are about that and not necessarily in a negative way but just the realities of it yeah i mean look well just as a quick comment on on this i guess we're partly lucky as authors because people can buy the ebook and and the audiobook and and those have sold well i think for business books they generally do but i think particularly for this one it's um it's done really well um, but as you said, I mean, the industry is just kind of really antiquated and it's really hard to get data. We don't really know how many audiobooks have sold. We won't know for potentially months, which is really strange, you know, for any industry to sell something digitally and not be able to, con you know, convey that data. But we have a sense. Um, but the, the supply chain stuff we ran into is just a tiny microcosm of what's going on. And I think we've learned over the last couple of years that we built supply chains in the world and built kind of manufacturing for efficiency, right? That's that's kind of the direct result of making shareholder maximization your only goal, right? You do things like you make something in one place because the larger the scale, the lower the cost, and then you ship it in and out. And what happens is if that one place is underwater or there's a drought or there's a storm, um, it it takes out your whole supply chain. And I think we've seen versions of that for years in, in extreme weather. And then the pandemic in terms of changing where we were demanding things, right? All toilet paper all of a sudden was going home instead of to home end businesses and restaurants, et cetera. And it just screwed everything up. And we're still kind of meandering through that. I, um, a couple of months ago, I flew over in my first in-person event. Um, I was at the Sustainable Brands event in San Diego and then had to go to San Francisco. And I flew right over the port of LA. And I took this picture looking down because it was a totally clear day of, I counted about 50 ships just sitting 
offshore. And I was like, okay, this is what it looks like in, in practice. They're just sitting there. There's not enough, you know, there's not, an, there haven't been enough truck drivers. There haven't been enough, you know, dock workers. It's tied to really everything we're talking about. The, the whole issue of inequality, people aren't getting the wages they really want. So they're, you know, they're in, they don't want to stay in crappy jobs. So there's not enough of them. I mean, it's just, it's, it's all connected. And I think, I hope that this kind of raises awareness about how connected everything is and how connected we all are, because that's the only way we're, only way we're going to get to solutions is kind of be in this together. I'm, I'm glad you, I, I'm glad you brought that up and it's so eloquent. And I think a lot of us are starting to see these connections. And that's also why there's a lot of, not only the microscopes been shown on some of the problems and, and what we could do to fix them, but there's also a lot more people saying, Hey, to change, to fix it, I need to change and, and to kind of look at new models, look at new ways of, of, of looking at the world and thinking about things. One of, one of the terms that you, you kind of mentioned also is this resilience. You know, how do we have some resilience in the system? Um, and, and really, I, I, I look at it as a bigger picture of how our infrastructures are kind of lagging behind. So we're not keeping up to speed with our exponentially growing world. And it's not just about efficiencies, but the infrastructure is just not there locally or globally to, to handle minor ripples or minor, minor things in, in the system. And um, th th it's resiliency is something that you talk about. And, and, and then we're going to talk about really beyond resiliency where we need to go as well. But I want to hear your takes on that and how that as well ties into this. I mean, look, resilience comes, um, and I, for my last book, I read a bunch of really great books on resilience. There's Anti-Fragile by Nick, Nicholas um, Taleb, you know, who, um, uh, Nicholas uh, Nassim Taleb, who wrote, um, you know, the, the Black Swan and Black all that. Yeah. Anti-Fragile is really great, kind of about the extremes that we face and you, and, and you can't predict everything. And there's, um, there's a book, book, couple books about resilience. Um, and, you know, it's really not that hard to lay out kind of key principles of what makes a natural system resilient. A lot of it's about diversity, right? That's part of what makes nature resilient is you don't rely on any one system um, and it's circular and, you know, things are feeding into each other, um, you know, and, and resilience means um, having kind of a broad set of strengths and a broad set of foundations. And that's true in your personal life, right? You need, you need some, you need some physical health. You need some support emotionally and societally from friends and family. I mean, you need like all these things to kind of be really resilient and be able to handle the ups and downs. And again, we built a system and the reason, I mean, let's be honest, the reason we haven't invested enough in like actual physical infrastructure in the U S in particular, but I think really everywhere is still part of that same, that same shareholder maximization thing is part of a larger kind of neoliberal economic model, right? For 50 plus years, that government's always the problem. We should shrink it as much as possible, lower taxes as much as possible, um, and basically not invest and every, everything will be privatized. Everything will be handled by the private sector. But that just doesn't pan out. Um, you know, I'm a, I work in the private sector, I'm a fan of it, but there's stuff that just has to happen at scale. Infrastructure is really one of the main ones. Um, when you get kind of libertarians and um, you know, neoliberals in a room, they'll admit we need defense, that's about it. But and sometimes you'll get them behind infrastructure, but look how hard it was. I mean, the Biden administration passed infrastructure for the first time, and every president's been talking about it for years just to keep roads and bridges from falling down, right? And that's like the most basic level versus investing in a modern infrastructure, much more public transport, much much better grids, smarter grids, so we can move energy around, we can have cars plug in, all the things we need to build a modern, healthy, more sustainable society. It takes investment, right? And um, and think how much better it is. I mean, if you've gone into like, say an airport that has been recently renovated or you, or you get to a train station or a bridge you've driven over many times and it's new, it actually feels good. Like it's the weirdest thing, but there's this sense of like, I feel this sense of like community, like LaGuardia was really one of the ugliest, worst airports in the world in New York. And they've redone over half of it now and they're building the rest. It's great. And you walk in and you feel like, oh, this is a community that wants to invest in itself. I feel cared for. You know, I feel like we've all done this together. I, it sounds crazy, but I really believe in building great, you know, great infrastructure and like schools that are the best in the world, the nicest for kids, you know, they should be in a great place, not a place that's falling down. But we have this philosophy that's been dominant that, I don't know, any government dollar is a wasted dollar. And, and, and we have to really break that down. Um, of course, we should be efficient with our shared dollars, but 
you can't make efficiency the only goal, right? Over the outcomes you want, which is a better life for everybody, a more thriving community. So I, I like Paul, I do a lot with the sustainable development goals and sustainable yeah. development goal advocate and, and, and sustainable development. Development, what is development? It's basically uh, uh, residential, commercial, public development, but with a key factor, not efficiency, but sustainable development, right. one that continues over time. And the, a lot of people don't really catch that connection. So in, in business, uh, and you mentioned it, and this is why I'm bringing it up, is these efficiencies that we're, you know, how do we maximize shareholder profit? How are we efficient? How do we squeeze every last drop uh, out of what we do? Um, but the but you're not talking about efficiencies. You're talking about infrastructure updates and renewals. That's not just a shiny new greenwashing or a new coat of paint. There's also renewable energy. There's also efficiency of how we handle trash and how we handle waste and how we handle energy in a whole different way. And it feels more like this co-op community, even in an airport where you're just a passing through kind of back and forth. It just is an amazing cool. feeling. And, and the same thing, I mean, kind of the whole, you know, message or, or story of the work I've been doing for 20 years and in this book is that this is a better path for business, right? Over the long term, there might be some short term sacrifices, I really call them investments. And it's the same thing we're talking about with infrastructure, we're acting like it's, it's efficiency versus a nice, you know, nice new infrastructure, but a newer infrastructure will, will almost definitely be more efficient over time, right? You, you put the money in up front. And it doesn't like a, if a bridge doesn't fall down, that saves a lot of money and lives and pain. And the problem is, it's always been true in business and in government. It people don't get rewarded for avoiding risk, you know, for the the, the bridge that didn't fall, right, or the the FDA that caught some substance that would have killed people, and you know, in a drug or in a food. It's really hard to reward that in our system, right? And you kind of react to problems. And it's hard. Look, it's hard to do. It's not like we don't try, but it's hard to reward, you know, smart risk avoidance. Um, but I feel like you have to start by working backwards, right? And that's kind of the one of the key messages of net positive is that outside in is this incredibly important input into how you think about your business and about organizations, meaning there's thresholds in the world. There's only so much stable climate, only so much water, air, and there's, you know, kind of physical thresholds and then minimum minimum kind of moral thresholds. Like you want, you hope that everyone can have a level of sufficiency in the world, all 8 billion of us that have a chance to thrive. And it's in between that, you know, minimum human threshold and maximum stuff threshold, which is what, you know, the economist Kate Raworth calls donut economics, you know, in that shape of a donut that we need to operate in. And that takes investment, but boy, is that rewarding, right? To be in a place where nobody, nobody suffers un unnecessarily. Everyone has a chance. Um, and the, and we're living within our means. Um, but that takes investment, right? It's, it's a, it's a balancing act. Yeah. It's a, it also ties to, and, and you, you took a lot upon this as well, the Stockholm Resilience Center, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, Dr. Johan Rockstrom and the planetary boundaries. Exactly. How do we live within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries? There's nine boundaries, but it's basically this donut economics. It's the circular economies mm -hmm. that there's a, a balance or a safe operating space uh, for us to work. There, there's one more thing that kind of ties to this economic, uh, this infrastructure that is really interesting because we, we see it in a lot of ways, but I don't think it snaps in, in, in a lot of us. For instance, today, kindergartner, preschool, and first graders, uh, according to the global population today that would need to be going into school, we would need to build 63,000 new classrooms every single day or every single week, sorry, in order to keep up with that population growth for those entering kindergarten, preschool and first grade. Around the world, we're building less than 100 a month. And so that infrastructure is far behind. And now I'm, I'm only talking about that, th those, those youth who are entering in into, into those Orders. I'm not talking about healthcare. You were talking about highways and bridges and, and, and airports, but uh, how about our healthcare? How about all these other things that are just not keeping up to speed because we're pinching pennies to to, to invest in military well, or somewhere else? It's so it's what the 
I mean, they weren't the only ones to do this, but the Democrats in the US about the Build Back Better plan here, they talked about it as social infrastructure. Um, I think it's a great phrase, right? Social infrastructure includes um, healthcare that you don't go bankrupt if you get sick and childcare pre-K so people can go to work. Like these are things that support the economy um, and support well-being. And it's just really hard to get consensus um, in some countries in particular, the US more than others, to support that kind of spending. There's, there's this sense of whether people deserve it or not, right? Whether they're getting a free ride. And it's, you know, I, I think it's all about what, what every system you design has errors, right? And you have to decide which errors you want. Um, you know, classically, like a, our, our justice system is innocent till proven guilty in the US, which means we lean towards innocence, meaning you let people, you let some people off who were, who were guilty rather than lock up people who aren't. That's kind of the, the, the goals or the, the trade-offs you have. And I think there's just differences of opinion about which errors you want. I think there's one philosophy that wants nobody to get anything they don't quote deserve, right? No, no, don't give anything to anyone and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And that's one philosophy. And I'd rather have a system where there is some percentage, some small percentage taking advantage, but no kids go hungry. Nobody goes bankrupt because they got sick. Like that's my, I'd rather have the error be some people get away with something, which by the way, is not um, a massive amount to live on food stamps or basic healthcare. Like these aren't like huge thriving amounts of money. They're just the very basics. Um, to I, hold on one I second. totally Sorry. agree. Running out of power. Okay. Yeah. The, the, there, there's a couple other things that are real great. And I want to touch on you that you're not setting the bar low here. So no. I was just at COP26 and in Glasgow and it was a complete failure. So the countries and the nations, they and the negotiators, they they didn't keep us at 1.5. They didn't reach the Paris Agreement. Not there was some things achieved, but I believe we left at uh, 2.3 degrees and clear up upwards of 2.5 degrees of warming. Um, and the big buzz, and you you talked about buzzwords or things that are kind of hot uh, uh, hot buzzwords, is uh, net zero. Let's go uh, carbon neutral. Let's go net zero, things like this. Um, and in my opinion, private sector corporations stepped up to the plate, even by the third day of the first week of the COP. The nations were, were failing us and doing whatever they do, but we're hearing numbers, 130 trillion U.S. dollars. Mark Carney and, and other groups uh, yeah. also that, but then by the second week, 140 trillion, 150 trillion, all from private corporations, organizations, commitments. Now, hopefully we can get them all to deliver. And then this, this net, net zero, and, and you have a unique way of, uh, of describing this is kind of what net zero means that it's a flat lining of death. I'd like you to describe that, but, but why do we always got to wait until the bar set and say, okay, here's the standard. We got to meet this and set the bar low. And this is saying, let's set the bar high. Let's leave yeah. things better than we found it. So I want you to tell us a little bit more about those two, two things. Yeah, look, it's, it's purposely aggressive. I think it's reflective. I mean, look, I've always tried to, I think, put the flag out there or put the bar high, but it's really reflecting a practical reality. I started writing about um, science-based goals, you know, 10 years ago. It was in my book that came out eight years ago, and I was early on that. I got a lot of pushback from people saying, why would a company set a goal based on science? And that's becoming rapidly the norm now. And I made the case at the time with clients, they would go present, if I could get them to, present options, you know, to the C-suite and say, okay, we want to set a goal. And like the science base, like let's cut emissions in half or let's get to um, 2050 zero was presented as this stretch target. And I've been making the case for a decade. That's the minimum, right? That's, this is what science says is the minimum to avoid the worst catastrophes. A stretch goal is actually to go beyond that to something like net positive. And until I started working with Paul and we could kind of put this down on paper, I didn't have the full language. I hadn't really thought through like a whole book about it. So, you know, and, and we were on Christiana Figueres' um, podcast, you know, the former head of the climate team at the UN. And 
she was commenting that we were out there when most companies and countries aren't even sure they can get to net zero. And we're already saying net positive and kind of already pushing the boundary. I think it's just practical, right? We waited too long. I think COP, the COP meeting result would have been perfectly adequate for something you want to improve and get better at um, and would have been great 10, 20 years ago. It's just inadequate to the science. It's, and this isn't like a Greenpeace opinion or this isn't just you know progressive. It's just the, the fact of the science. And so we really believe that companies that are going beyond, I mean, net zero just says we want to get to zero carbon but it's not even necessarily the same as decarbonizing. We have to get to z like actual zero carbon in the economy. So you can't by 2050 be planting trees over here and emitting, like you just really have to take carbon out of the equation. Um, and that's much harder. And I guess, you know, my belief is that because there's always laggards and it's always hard to get some countries and some companies, the leaders have to go beyond. They have to make up for that gap in a way. And we believe that those companies will outperform and those countries will, out will outperform and they already are. I mean, the companies that are taking on a longer term view, trying to go down this path to real resilience, to real regenerative, to real net positive, they've been outperforming in recent years. They're doing better. They're attracting more talent, right? All of it. Um, during COVID, during right. economic downturn, yeah. they're proving that it's a they're better proving, model. I mean, look, you can't guarantee. It's always been ridiculous to say, oh, sustainable investments have to prove they always outperform. That's been the weirdest thing to me because there's no investment thesis in the world that has to prove that. Because if it always outperformed, all the money would go to it. I mean, it would be the only way you'd invest. But for now, it's been outperforming. And I think it will in the long run. Um, and I think you know, Lever proved that. They outperformed their peers for the 10 years Paul was there. Um, so I, look, I, I think it's just a, to me, this sustainability thing's always been, I got into this 20 years ago for really practical reasons. Like we're using the world too fast. It's not going to be stable. It's not going to be literally sustainable. We're not going to be able to keep doing this. So practically speaking, we have to change paths. And, and that's, you know, that's what I keep trying to do with books and, and consulting and, and um, speaking is, is kind of push companies and executives to think more ambitious in a more ambitious way about where we're headed. What I really like about the book is uh, the story and the way you bring in Unilever, you bring in Paul. Uh, he, he wasn't always with Unilever. He was with um, another organization before and he came to Unilever and then did this really kind of far out way of thinking and also was one of the, the uh, first to kind of be asked to be part of the sustainable development goals and kind yeah. of join in this whole movement and, and do a push. And during this time, there are several examples that uh, between Nestle and Unilever, where there's kind of some things. And uh, the, the reality is, is uh, for the big part, Unilever is a soap company, but they have food products. And yeah. um, I, I, I kind of want to know how, how did that that marriage to the book come about? And why is why is Paul such a good example to to go forward with this and and what kind of, what were some aha moments for you as well as yeah. you're going through this process yeah you know i i knew unilever pretty well like they were the company i talked about the most in in my previous book the big pivot i was on their advisory board in the us um for years i i didn't know um paul that well i had met him a couple of times i mean he's he's met millions of people it seems like i mean he's 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 a truly global um connected individual and he's a real genuine person. So I, he approached me a little over, you know, two, two and a half years ago about, Hey, I, I keep getting asked to write a book. Um, Harvard university press is really, pre you know, pushing. And that's who I've been working with and writing for, for a number of years. So it kind of was a good marriage, but he just, he, he wanted someone who, you know, can write, you know, English is a first language, I guess is part of it, honestly, but also he's not a writer. He, he, He's a communicator for sure. And he's run giant companies, but this is, you know, he doesn't sit down and write that much. Um, but also someone who knew the space and could bring content and perspective. So I think it was a good, it's been a good pairing, right? So my job in the world is generally kind of synthesis, really seeing what's happening in the world, bringing mega trends together, seeing what companies are starting to do and saying, okay, here's where we're headed. It's not to me futurism, it's really like presentism. It's like looking at what's already happening and saying, this is the stuff that's obviously, you know, already accelerating um, and where we need to go, kind of that outside in threshold, you know, perspective. Um, and working with Paul has been an aha kind of personally. He's he is a genuine human being. He really does want success for everyone. 
He's a very uh, personal leader. I learned a lot. And we have some stories in the book about him writing handwritten notes, doing, you know, looking at 300 executive development plans and commenting on each of them. He's as like you, when you meet CEOs, this is typical. He works so hard and so many hours and I can't keep up with, with that. I'm more of a life balance, you know, read a book at night, hang out with, you know, I just, I, I don't have that kind of energy, I think. But there were ahas about, for me, about this sustainability thing that I've been working on for years that were, that were really kind of nuances to how do you pursue this and build this kind of company? And, and, and one is that you can say the long, you know, the medium to long run is that we improve in all dimensions and we move towards net positive, which is, you know, improve the well-being of everybody we touch, but that there, there are choices. It doesn't necessarily mean trade-offs, but that you can't do everything at once. And he, he has that practical reality of being CEO. And we talk in the book about this, that you might have, you know, one factory that says this year, we just got to be, we got to cut some costs and we got to cut energy use and it helps with our sustainability goals, but we're really focused on this. Another brand might focus on um, doing some kind of, you know, um, purpose-based initiative and really connecting to the community and investing in that as part of their marketing, that you're going to have different kind of goals that move things along, different stakeholders that are that are uh, pleased and, and affected in different ways and that you have to make some choices. This is strategic, like any, any business thing. And that was like a really subtle nuance to this. It's so easy from the outside to just say, be better to companies, but to really dig in and say, how do you do that? What are the choices you make? What's the framework? And I think, you know, we provided, I hope, like, you know, a framework of purpose, starting with yourself and your business and, and giving people in the company the leeway to make smarter decisions and that mix of things they need to accomplish over time. Cause he really pushed back on that short-term pressure. The reason you can't make a choice like, Oh, I'm going to do efficiency for this six months and then work on purpose. You know, the reason you can't do that is because you have to hit your quarterly numbers, right. For the market and you need to free up, free up people. So I think it was really critical. The critical thing he did was he stopped talking to investors every quarter and he freed up his managers basically to make, broader choices, to be smarter, to have more um, ownership, you know, further down the chain. He talks about bringing complexity up in the business instead of pushing it down and making people make hard decisions, like bring the really hard global and shared challenges up to the top people and let the, let the people in the middle and, and below make smarter decisions for their customers, for their people, you know, and, and, and just concentrate on making the business better. I think it's, it's that mix of skills that's really hard to capture, but I think, I think we did. I think we did. So there's a couple uh, other other books and uh, uh, acquaintances. John Elkington, Green Swans, and, yeah. and Paul have have connected before as well. And I don't know about you as well, yeah. but also um, um, Paul Hawking and his new book Regeneration. And there's been some mixed uh, support there as well. But there's this thing that emerges in, in, in the book. Um, it's kind of this regenerative capitalism or this regenerative economic principles, this kind of going, leaving the, the world better than you found it as an organization, as a business, as a corporation, that, and, uh, and you have an eloquent way of saying that, you know, how, what do you, what do you bring into the world? And so I, I don't even want to take it out of your mouth. I'd like you to say it and, and Tell us a little bit more about those connections, because those are some of the buzzwords that we're hearing beyond net zero and resilience. I think those, those things are fabulous. They've been around forever. Regeneration is not a buzzword. It's been around forever. Leonardo da Vinci wrote about it. But I, I think that's the direction more of where we need to go for the future. And that's, that's what you so eloquently, uh, you and Paul both kind of bring together in the book. And I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. So, you know, as I said, net positive is about ambition. It's, it's effectively equivalent to regenerative enterprise. And we talk about it in the book. I talked about regenerative in my last book eight years ago. And it's, as you said, these terms and circular, right? Circular has been around really forever, but there's been academics talking about it for 40, 50 years. And just, again, as it became clear in the world that we were starting to bump up against limits, circular kind of natural, naturally comes out of it. And then as you watch nature more, you realize it's circular and regenerative. It's it's improving. I think you know we, but we chose net positive, um, you know, in a very deliberate way. Um, you know, my first book is called Green to Gold. It's completely unsubtle. It's 
green equals gold, right? It's, it's telling business people, because at that point, and still for many businesses, they need to hear this green thing is an anti-business, right? It doesn't just cost more. And so we said, oh, you can make money from this. That was kind of the core message. You can cut costs and risk and you can innovate and create brand value and all these good things. Um, you know, the language matters for reaching people. So I, I feel like I don't really care what language people use as long as the ambition level is high. Uh, Walmart, for example, has adopted regenerative. They want to be a regenerative enterprise. They're talking about that with their suppliers, great. Um, some of the fashion companies Paul's worked with um, very closely um, have put out you know, regenerative type goals like um, saving six times more land than the land they use in their supply chain through cotton and everything. That, whatever works for an organization, if that's the language they can use, I just find that there's such a mass market of people that are still like, what's this sustainability thing? Like we in the space have been using these words forever, but there's still a huge number, especially abroad where, you know, I talk to people in a lot of different countries and, and, you know, ESG is now the phrase is one of the big phrases and it's kind of just reaching some of these places and regenerative can sound like too, like too hard in a way, like, you know, they don't even know what it means. And I most get people stairs. say, are you going to talk to me about agriculture, about right. farming? Well, that, that's, that's, that's been think. the one clear use of it. You kind of get it when you go, okay, a, a form of agriculture that sequesters carbon that improves, you know, the air improves, you know, the, the, the balance of, of carbon in the atmosphere, you kind of get that. Um, it's hard to know what a regenerative human rights policy is in your supply chain and apparel. I know it means things like living wages for everyone, but we just kind of went with positive. Like you want to leave things better than you found them. You want to have a positive impact just for simplicity's sake in a way. And if you want to use different language at different times, in different places, you could use regenerative for part of your impacts. So you could use just positive for others. Um, that's fine, right? I just think it's the level of ambition. So everyone you you mentioned, John Elkington's a friend, a mentor. He's you know he's been a genius. Um, you know, I've I guess my career has been somewhat similar to his, but he's he's done so much. And Green Swans is a great book. I mean, he's got twenty books, which shocks me. I'm on four, and I can't imagine doing twenty. Honestly, it's so hard. Um, and of course, Paul Hawken, right? Paul Hawken, you know, the ecology of commerce is like the book that really kicked this, really kicked off the business. I mean, once you get past kind of silent spring, just saying business has this impact, he's the one who first put down, hey, business has this deep role in the ecology of the, of the you know, economies. It's um, what, 40, you know, 30 years ago now, right? The book's out 30 years ago, I think this coming year. And it's foundational. Um, and the, regen you know, the regeneration he's talking about the, the drawdown stuff, really critical. I and mean, I think there's some really critical books out right now that add to the canon of raising the ambition level. Um, and John's always fun to read because it's just a fun, it's just a fun read about green swans instead of black swans, these things that cause amazing positive impacts, right? We're seeing those exponential changes in things like renewable energy, right? We need to get those going and invest in them and really kickstart, you know, accelerate them. So these are all really important views um, and all, all worth looking at. But, you know, ours, ours is generally kind of how do you build a company around this? And for, I think, NGOs and government leaders, they should read ours also to understand what a company needs to look like and how they can help those companies become more net positive and regenerative. So I, I didn't bring them up because I think there's a lot of books out there. I think your book definitely stands out. And there's only a few books, uh, honestly, that really move in that the right direction that people even know about. The interesting thing about regeneration from Paul Hawken is he says people don't understand these terms. It's exactly what you just said. What is sustainability? What does that mean? Is it for me? Is it for cities, countries, corporations? Who's, who's that for? What does it mean? regeneration and ESG. Uh, but what we have seen is the COP26 of the biggest news and uh, uh, information and uh, awareness that any COP in history has ever had. More private and uh, public sponsorships, so to say, and awareness and eyes and media um, that people are waking up. They're like, oh my goodness, there's something to this. What, what is this? And uh, that's, that's unbelievable. But now they're, they're saying, but I, I, I still don't understand what they're saying. You, you're saying there's, uh, it's, that's okay, 
here's some models, here's some ways to look at it. You don't need to be uh, a scholar in the 17 different meanings of sustainability or the you know 11 different meanings of resilience, but this is what it means and how it goes. The other thing is pivotal at uh, this time uh, in July, I think it was July, July 14th or 12th of this year, the ES, EU ESG taxonomy came out. That's where they say, here's our taxonomy. Here's the, the kind of regulation for sustainable investing. You know, when there's a, a regulation or a taxonomy that comes out that you're already seven years behind, and uh, that's about as low as the bar can get. So it, yeah. it, that's why we need net positive. Yeah. That's why we say, hey, let's not try to strive to this standard that has just been set. And, oh, we've got another requirement that we have to meet. But there's another model that if we set the bar higher, we think more in the future, that just is a better operating system that's for right. everybody in your organization. And that, that that's kind of what I really get out of this. And, and, and I want to hear even more from you of kind of yeah. some stories and things that you, that you feel about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I should have said before, when we're talking about language, I think our mutual friend, you know, Hunter Lovins, she always says sustainability is basically just getting your nose above the water, like the things filling up and you're just... You're just saving yourself. Um, you know, uh, regenerative or net positive is really kind of getting yourself out of the out of the hole um, and building something positive. Um, you know, I'll just tell you kind of quickly. I guess what's the order of battle in in the book that we lay out? And, um, and it took a lot of work. Paul and I were speaking a lot about the structure of kind of the the order you do things, the things that are important to get done first, so you can start to build this kind of organization. And we start like inside, like really inside with yourself, like the first, after we lay out the principles in the book of kind of a net positive company, we go through the kind of steps really. And the first thing is like, who are you, you know, and, and as a leader, as a person reading this, um, we have a chapter called how much do you care? Like, do you care that, you know, there's a billion or 2 billion people without access to water, or food, you know, these kind of basics, do you care the climate is, you know, in, in so much trouble? Um, and if you do, okay, what's your purpose? What are you trying to do in the world? And how does that tie to the work you're doing? Um, and then we move into like organizational purpose, right? Which there's a lot of discussion about. Um, and I think we captured a lot of how Unilever evolved from when Paul got there and had some of this purpose in history for sure, um, but really made it the core of the business. And so how do you, how do you bring purpose into the business and into everybody at the company, the exec, you know, the executives, the employees. Um, and then we talk about building um, kind of these, these sets of goals that are really huge, that are really thinking big, and what we call blowing up your boundaries. So you're, you're, you're reacting to those thresholds that are out there and saying, okay, we need zero waste or zero carbon because of the shared problems, but you're still working on your kind of yourself, right? But with the, with the outside perspective. And then the, the transition to the outside world is really building trust and transparency. And that we talk about is really opening up, being humble, being vulnerable as a business, opening up to NGOs and critics. We talk about the difference between um, critics and cynics. Um, there's the people who just wanna knock you down, but there's some really smart NGOs who are, that are critical, but they can bring real knowledge. And then you kind of finally get to, in some sense, the heart of the book, which is partnerships. And we talk quite a bit for a couple chapters, really, about different kinds of partnerships to solve shared problems with your peers, your supply chain, and these systemic challenges, like sitting down with civil society and government to solve the really big challenges. Um, so those are kind of the main steps. We, we talk about culture as well, that we kind of end with that in a way, because you, it's like the result of all the things you do that you've built this kind of culture. And then we have this chapter that has become the, the one that most people have commented on or that we've gotten a lot of attention for, which is we talk about as the elephants in the room, which is we name all these things that nobody wants to talk about, that we say, you can't be positive if you don't address these, you know, in particular things like paying taxes and having companies like Amazon that really haven't paid taxes or, and it turns out Bezos himself, right? Not really paying any taxes and corruption, of course, C CEO pay, we say right out, they just make too much money, right? They compared to their, their staff. And that's, that's getting so much more attention. I was just reading like this month's fortune magazine, and there's just much more natural discussion of CEOs. The ratio to pay is because this whole great resignation is there's an article in fortune that says it's really that we need pay raises this is from fortune right saying like that like 
that the people need to be paid more and that ratio to CEOs has to close because um, inequality is kind of destabilizing. So we lay, we lay out all these things, you know, human rights, you know, real diversity and inclusion and say, you're not positive if you're not at least at the table on a bunch of these issues. And, and they're uncomfortable, right? I mean, part of this is being uncomfortable. Um, but so is anything where you make progress. Like it's not comfortable necessarily to run, you know, or, or you know, bike or do the things you do for exercise. You can get a runner's high, but it's not like it's always fun, right? I mean, like it is hard work, but the feeling of improving of, of and then day to day, you feel better. I think that's kind of what we're talking about as a business. You work out all these problems, you work on your issues, um, you find your strengths and your purpose and aggressively lean into it. And I think you just build this, I think, much more fun, interesting place to work and to be. I love how, how you um, summarize the book there. It is so true that not only uh, Paul, but you as well, Paul's been involved in the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the International Chamber of Commerce, the Global Compact, a, a, a global SDG advocate, and on and on of, you know, uh, uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, all these different international global organizations partnering, coming together with Coke, Pepsi, Unilever, Nestle, whoever uh, in there to to learn, to grow, that it's not a competition, but how can we all go there together much more sustainably, much more resiliently uh, and, and help each other for these coming future problems that we're all going to be facing. And I, I've always loved, loved that about uh, Paul. And I mean, that's how I originally first got to know him was the International Chamber of Commerce. So um, I, I think that's such a, a vital thing. So this is you're practicing what you preach but then let's set the, the bar higher, which is almost a thought for futurism. You know, what, what is the future going to look like where we're going? How, what, how, how are we going to make sure we get there and we have that thing, how we started our discussion today? How are we going to have that sustainable supply chain or have the resources delivered? Are they going to be there? Are they going to be gone? Is the system going to break down? And um, it's definitely for for everyone. And it's, it's one that I've been pushing a lot and, and promoting just for the simple fact, a lot of people are like, yeah, we're going net positive. Mark, can you come over and talk to us about, you know, net zero and net positive? And I'm like saying, if, if, if you, if you go uh, net zero or carbon neutral, you're dead, you're flatlining. And let's, let's set the bar higher. Let's capture carbon. Let's go net positive. Let's do things in a positive direction, leave the world better. And we found it. And so that's exactly what, what the buck sums up. I don't want to give too many teases or takeaways, but it's very courageous. And, and I absolutely, yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, what is, you know, with all the trials and turbulations, what's the craziest thing you're, you're kind of learning? You're like, Boy, I never would have expected that. Uh, be, I mean, you mentioned the elephant in the room, but is there any other kind of things that have come out? You're like, I, I was, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's some nuance to how you that you know Paul really brings to how you run a company like this. I just want to say one thing, which is, you say it's courageous, and it's funny that we've accepted in business as part of this shareholder thing that you should grow, grow, grow. Um, and so we're fine, right? Every business should grow. It should grow its profits. It should grow its impact on the world. But we've apparently accepted that those impacts are whatever they are. They're, you know, we use resources up, we use people up. But if you say, well, grow your positive impact, they're like, hey, hey, wait now. Like that's, that's somehow anti-business. It's like, why? You're, if you're a fan of growth, how about we grow the positive impact on all, all stakeholders, you know, not just shareholders at the expense of others. So I think you know, trying to speak about it in that way I think the, the, I don't know if it's a big aha, but the hardest conversation, um, the question I get a lot as I do, I've been doing events and podcasts every day for a couple of months and will for a while, there's usually something about um, growth and consumption because people are a lot smarter about it, especially younger audiences. They're looking at the future and saying, how can we keep using? And, and it's a really tough conversation. And I think Part of the aha for me that I really, I, I had thoughts on, but it really developed as we wrote this is, and we talk about it towards the end of the book, that the really biggest questions that a net positive company has to start to answer 
are capitalism and growth and consumption and democracy and science and fact and all these really challenging issues that are scary. And, and if we don't handle, we've got really big problems. And I think this question of growth and consumption, the we talk about it briefly in the book, but I feel like growth is okay, but it, it, it matters what kind of growth, right? As we go to eight, nine, 10 billion people, there's gonna need to be a growth of quality of life for people, so there's sufficiency. Now we can leapfrog, so just like with mobile versus phones, land, you know, landlines, you could leapfrog to renewables in a lot of places in the world and not have to have as much of a footprint, but there's still gonna be more use, more material stuff. So that has to grow for people to, to, to be doing better. So what has to shrink? I, I think we have to have a really hard conversation. Um, I don't know if you've read Han, Hans Rosling's book, Factfulness. Have, about, yeah. And what the big aha in that book is that there isn't developing countries and developed countries. There is, but that there's really levels of wealth and quality of life within every country. Um, and some countries have more of one level than another, but there's kind of that one, two, three, four. Four is the real base, you know, a few dollars a day. One is you know, Europe, US, the, the majority of middle and upper class, a billion maybe or so people. I feel like that billion, we have to have a hard conversation. Um, again, had we started this 30 years ago, we'd probably be okay maybe getting to circular, but now we do have to cut emissions drastically. We have to cut material use. We're not at circular solutions yet. We're not at regenerative agriculture yet. So I think we have to have this hard conversation about allowing growth in the places where people really need it and really questioning what's needed versus wants. And I think the younger members, you know, the, the, the young millennials, the Gen Z in the richer parts of the world, they are having that conversation. They want simplicity. They're buying more secondhand clothes. They're, you know, they don't want as much stuff. They don't want as big a house. They don't want cars as much. So we're starting to have that really hard conversation. Um, and there's a quote that, I, uh, that we have in the book from Gandhi. Um, and it, it's, it's so powerful. He just says, the rich must live simply so the poor can simply live. And to me, that's, that's the conversation we have to have. And in business, it's very hard to say, hey, let's degrow. Let's have some degrowth in parts of the world um, and really assess what's needed by the, by the wealthiest. Um, and I think we've, because of the pandemic, been able to question things like flying around a lot. Like we can probably do less of that, right? And that's a big footprint in, in my life. I had a huge carbon footprint flying all over the world to talk about climate change, ironically, it, you know, um, but that's the way you reach people. But now I think we're discovering this is not the same as in person, but it's not as bad as we thought. And you can have influence, you can reach people. Um, so I think we got to do more of this, right? More of not driving and flying around, asking what we really need, all of that. So these are the hard, the really hard, uh -huh, really hard um, question in this book. Before, before the uh, pandemic, I was, um, sat on a board of 21 different airlines trying to advise them about mm -hmm. sustainability and the future of flight mm -hmm. and things. And, and, and they, they never liked what I had to say. Absolutely not. Um, and their, their, their deadlines and dates, and there have been some, so there is a United Nations organization that's specifically around aviation and the sustainability of aviation in the future. And, um, they had just in 2019 in January met the first deadline towards a carbon offsetting Corsia program and things like that. But their dates were still so far 2050, 2060 to even kind of change that field. And now we look at it today, there's so much talk and noise about how they're thinking, okay, how do we do different fuels? How can we fly sustainably drone taxis and stuff? So, uh, you know, no, no matter how bad the pandemic is, no matter how bad all, all this uh, has come to, uh, it's been a wake up call for many people that we need to shift our business models to, to something else and be net positive. How can we still fly, but doing it in a way that doesn't harm human health and our planet and things like that. There, there's one other thing. So you mentioned Kate Rollworth and, and the donut economics. Uh, I had Tim Jackson of the cusp and, and he wrote uh, um, um, prosperity without growth. Post prosperity without growth and uh, post growth. Uh, were, were his two books, and he was on the podcast as well. Uh, the discussion is, is we kind of need a shift to a different economic model. And so yeah. I, I want to ask you the question, 
is it circular economy? Is it uh, a planetary boundaries economy? Is it mission economics from Mariana Matsukata? Mm -hmm. Is it donut economics? Is it cusp ec economics, ecological economics, steady state economics? I mean, there's so many, and most of us wouldn't know those because yeah. we're not involved in that. Um, so, so I want to first ask that model. But the second thing is, is really, and Kate says this in donut economics, the way we're being educated around economics is this, this white male with a tie who's learning these outdated principles of economics yeah. in an outdated system form of education, whatever school you go to. And the same thing is for net positive, you also want to start a movement of yeah. education and how you're not only Harvard, not only Yale, but everywhere. How do yeah. we change these models so that the current startups, the current leaders are getting the right education. We get a movement in new curricula that is telling people, hey, be prepared for the future. That this is where we need to go. And so those are the two things. How, how do you make sense of that? And how do we get the movement going to get it in, into the curricula? Like, like we said before, I think all the terms are somewhat equal. I, I think we're all talking about the same thing, which is living within these thresholds, whatever you call it. I will just say that I got an economics degree um, 30 years ago now. And it's completely like outdated, right? It was still fundamentally econ 101 and 102 about maximizing utils and, and margin, you know, companies coming in new entrants to the point where the marginal profit goes down to zero, all this stuff that ignores all of the monopoly power, really, you talk about it, but you're like, oh, you know, new entrants that hasn't worked out with the tech giants, right? They're just more and more profitable. I just, I just read that the companies in the last couple of years, in the last year, as Inflation is their profits have actually been going up. They've been basically passing along the inflation directly to consumers. So they have the money to raise wages, by the way. Like that's kind of the conclusion in this Fortune article I was reading. Um, so, I, in a way, I'm not sure that, again, the terms matter. We're all kind of saying the same thing. Um, uh, what was the second half of your question? It was about those terms. Is, then... I mean, so you, you're getting ready to start. And I think I've already oh, seen movement. some teasings yeah. that yeah, yeah. net positive, how do we get that into curriculum? How do we? Yeah, get yeah, more yeah. people aware of, of the book and, and and to the because it's a it's a different type of a model it's a different yeah. almost a different type of economic model in, in your organization if, yeah. if it's done right yeah no so we i think there's been people working on the education question for years there's a bunch of skills that we need now like i think from grade school up teaching systems thinking teaching this kind of level of connection teaching how to work together and i will say i've seen in my as my kids are two teenagers as they've grown up, they did a lot of group projects and, you know, using Google Docs and things in elementary school even. And I was like, and pre presenting, I was like, oh, there's some really interesting trickle down of the skills you need that have gotten into the lower grades, but there has to be much more about the connectivity of everything and, and, and what the sustainable issues are, what the thresholds are. And then I think at the, you know, undergrad and, and graduate level, especially business schools, it has to get into the core curricula. Right now, there's been this broad agreement for decades that your opening semester of business school is a strategy class, marketing, operations, finance, accounting, you know, but you don't really talk about sustainability until it's an elective. Um, and those electives are really popular. Our, our friend Rebecca Henderson at Harvard has had this class reimagining capitalism. That's the most popular at Harvard Business School for years and years. So I think the younger generations are asking for it, but there's only a handful of these integrated sustainability MBAs, where that's the purpose, or a master's in sustainability, but all curriculum needs to change. Like if you're going through a strategy class and not talking deeply about stakeholders or about carbon or operations and not talking about value chain impacts, I don't think you're ready for the modern world. Um, and so we're, we are working on a movement. We're talking to professors where, and there's organizations like UN Prime, which have you know assembled hundreds of schools around the world to say we got to get more sustainability into business school education. Paul's been involved with some of these as well for a long time. So we're trying to figure this out. How do you get it into curriculum? How do you get this level of ambition? Um, and even down into undergrad. And my books have, have often been used in classes at great schools, so that, that's part of it. But just getting it into another sustainable business elective isn't enough, right? It has to be getting this thinking into the core. Um, and that's a very tough thing to do, right? There's a lot of inertia in academia. There's, there's a, there's a reason they got to this kind of set of classes. And it's hard to say, where's the hub of deciding what that core is? Like, it's kind of a, a net, network system conclusion. I mean, I know there's 
there's bodies, right, that of education, but who really decides that, that there's, and this is the kind of stuff we're starting to figure out. We're also trying to foment a movement with young people. We've been talking to YPO, the Young Professionals Organization, and getting their advice on how do you excite 20-somethings to make this so that our goal is that people come out of school and say, I want to work for a net positive company. Like that's the language of ambition that they want and that they'll only work for a net positive company. And, and so how do we get that movement going? So I, I ask people to um, come to our website, netpositive.world, sign up for the kind of newsletter and, and kind of communication as we figure this out and, and you know, send us feedback. Where, you know, where should we start? We're getting some really great ideas from people. Um, I just found out a guy is starting a net positive like business chapter in Scotland, like that kind of thing where you try to make it, um, you know, something that is done locally, is done regionally. That's how you start to see a real movement in, in how we talk about business. And that's that's the goal. I, I love that. So since um, Paul kind of left Unilever, um, I think it was 2019, wasn't it, when he yeah. left in December? Um, um He's gone on to a new organization, but he's still connected with all those international organizations that I mentioned. And so um, they they have sections in there that are talking about how do we get it into curriculum? How do we get these the this book in, into the curriculum and, and those movements? It is he actively kind of as well shaping that as um doing the teaching, getting that in there. What's his new organization or foundation? Imagine, is that, is that? Yeah, Imagine is the group he started. He what started with do? a few. Yeah, I started Imagine with a few, you know, key folks, couple, you know, um, Unilever people, Case Kreithoff, who ran North America, Jeff Seabright, who's been a longtime sustainability leader, and basically was like the third author of the book. He was on every call and he was so integral. Um, and, um, and Valerie um, Keller, who, is a you know leadership purpose driven lead, kind of took Unilever's new team as they were transitioning from Paul to the new team through a whole process of getting kind of re-engaging on their purpose and going deeper. And they started um, Imagine, and they basically do what they call collective courage, basic you know bringing together um, big groups. You know, Paul's brought together 25 or so CEOs from apparel, 25 or so from food and ag to work as as a sector. Um, and the fashion pact is one of the things that came out of it, where they agreed as a sector to um, set science-based targets, you know, biodiversity work to be regenerative and on and on. Um, and they're also doing increasingly kind of, uh, you know, more corporate consulting with companies to help them go down this path. So it's, it's, it's more of a, a collective action organization at core, but also doing some, some consulting. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking to like all the big consulting firms too. I mean, we want everybody, we're kind of open source. We want everybody to adopt this. Like one of the consulting firms bought thousands, 10,000 copies, I think, for their employees, another 1,000. Like Fabulous. we want it in everybody's thinking. Um, and I don't really care. You know, people will email me, oh, can we use the term? I'm like, it's a book. It's open. I mean, like, it's not, we didn't yeah. trademark this. Like, go. We don't have time. There's enough work to go around, right? We need thousands Absolutely. and thousands of companies and let alone the millions of SMEs. Um, that's another piece of work we're looking at is, do we write a version or a short or something that's really focused on SMEs that pulls out the stuff in there that's best for SMEs um, and kind of lightens up on the things that they can't do very. I mean, the, the big stuff that they can't do is really supply chain work. Pressuring suppliers is not what a small business is able to do, but so much of the agenda here, especially the innovation agenda, SMEs have so much, um, I think, potential. And that's where a lot of the innovation in sectors comes from anyways. So anyways, there's, um, you know, lots, lots going on. We're trying to make this a bigger movement. That. And that starts with, you know, getting, frankly, getting the book in as many hands as possible and getting people thinking about what it means for them and their business. I love it. The last and hardest question I have for you today um, is also my favorite. It's a little bit different than last time, mm -hmm. um, but it kind of, kind of is the same. I want you to answer this for you. Yeah. As Andrew Winston. <laughs> What does a world that works for everyone look like to you? Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. So I've been hosting a short run podcast myself and we ask everybody, what does the world look like in 20 years? And I haven't turned it on myself that, that much. Um, I think a world that, you know, an economy or a world that works for everyone is one where everyone everywhere has the, the, the chance to thrive, the fair chance to thrive. It's not saying 
everybody's equal. It's not some equality of, of income or wealth. There's always going to be gaps. It's, it's, as I said before, nobody, nobody goes bankrupt because they get sick, right? There's, there's, it's, we talk about it in the book. There's the John Rawls um, philosophy, you know, philosophy, the veil of ignorance, you know, that thought exercise, which is how would you design a system if you didn't know who you were going to be in that system? That's the kind of system that, that, I imagine, right? That everybody has a chance. Everybody is treated with the opportunity. It doesn't mean exactly equally. We recognize differences. People come from different backgrounds, but you have enough, right? You start with enough to eat, to have the basics, to have water, clean water, sanitation, that you're able to you know, send your kids to school. The kids don't have to work when they're little. They can go to school. Um, girls are educated. It's basically the SDGs, right? That's the business plan for a world that works for everyone is we've gotten rid of hunger and deprivation and we've controlled climate change enough so that everybody has a chance. Um, and imagine, you know, people use this, it's a line that seems so trite, but imagine how many Einsteins might be out there if you weren't losing billions of people a year to not being educated, right? Like what's the potential of humanity? And God knows we need potential and we need ideas. How do we get to this more livable place? I think having 8 billion brains working on it is a hell of a lot better than, you know, the billion that can get highly educated. So, you know, that's, that's the vision um, where it isn't just pull, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps is so often ludicrous. It's so beyond what some people are able to do. They don't have the start. They don't have the bootstraps. They don't have the, the they don't have shoes, right? I mean, it's, it's just, it's absurd. So I think there's a base level of, of dignity and respect that we give everyone. And if you do that, you're also going to respect the planet and, and its inhabitants so that you also want a stable climate, right? It comes from that same level of dignity. It's not a very dignified world to keep eating up our resources. So I know there's no elevator pitch version of that. It's a pretty complicated thing. And it's part of the reason, by the way, that I think all of us in sustainability always have like a, there's a communication problem versus the freedom, low taxes. Like there's all these like quick words of the kind of non or anti-sustainability crowd. And we don't have those eight words because it isn't eight words, you know, it is a longer discussion about what it really looks and feels like to be in that kind of world. I love it. You set up perfectly. And it ties. Did I? Uh, it was, I, so I wish many... I could do it shorter. I don't know if that was perfect. No, but... I don't want to do it shorter because I want that depth and substance. I, I really think you hit the nail on the head. There is, there is no elevator pitch. There is no quick solution to solve humanity suffering and our global grand challenges. Yeah. Um, if there was, we'd already have done it, but we need yeah. this systemic and very complex approach and address all of those facets to solve it. And I mean, that, that thought experiment, you know, how would you design it? How would you do that uh, thought experiment is very similar to Kim Pullman's book, Imaginal Cell. Yeah. There's one famous quote in there, and it's the, the golden rule that's always been around, uh, treat people and planet how you would like mm -hmm. to be treated. When you designed it, when you can have that thought experiment, uh, if, if you designed it any other way, then you're, you're basically hurting yourself. So why not do it in a way that you would like to have it? You know? And so I right. think that's beautiful. And the optimistic, I think, point about this, and it's hard at times to keep optimism, is that we actually have the resources, right? We have the money. We have a, almost all the solutions, at least for you know, drastically cutting carbon. And then we'll need some, a little more innovation. You know, it's obviously not easy to just say, we'll give everyone a vaccine. There's distribution. There's all these issues, but we have the money. And what's scary is two or three people on the planet have the money. Like Elon Musk and Bezos and Gates could pay for water for everyone, you know, solar all over the world. I mean, easily, right? Like, and we spent something like $20 trillion in governments around the world to fight the pandemic. So the money's there, right? Like we have the resources. So I feel like we're going to kind of wake up to that at some point that we can do this. We actually can make a thriving world for all. Andrew, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been <laughs> thank fabulous. You. Everyone go out and get in that positive. We'll put all the links in the show notes and uh, I hope we can speak very soon. Thanks yeah, so much, thank Andrew. Take Thanks care. so much.